Hello, can you hear me? Oh, no, mate, all right. Hey, hey, there we go. Didn't know. <laughs> I'm like, you know, there's, you've got Zoom and you've got like Teams and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> I, 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 I can never remember what sort of interface and buttons do what. It's a fucking nightmare. <laughs> yeah, fair play, mate. Yeah, I just stick to Zoom. It's what, uh, it's what's got me this far, anyway. <laughs> it's, a, it's what it's what the professionals use, isn't it? Um, but yeah, I think so. Well, I think a lot of people do in person ones now, don't they? But yeah, yeah I've stuck yeah. to uh, hiding behind my computer. <laughs> yeah, see, it, well, you know, stick to what you know. It's worked so far, hasn't it? So why you know, <laughs> you start you start trying to do something new, and, and the next minute it's all gone wrong. <laughs> yeah, so no, that's that's. Yeah. that's 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 sort of advice for life in general. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just leave the dice alone kind of thing. Yeah. Mm. Um so you're in London, is that right? Yeah, that's right. North London. Yeah. Okay, cool. Whereabouts in North London? Uh interested. Muswell Hill. Ah, uh, okay. Don't find that so, area yeah. particularly well, but it's it's great because it's I mean it's on a hill, so obviously it's really high up. So in the next ten years when the flood waters come. We'll be fine. <laughs> Good thinking there. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, did get a question from Laura saying uh when when are you gonna paint the ba- paint the bathroom pink, she said. Um oh yeah, I've got an answer to that. Never. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Um obviously yeah, Laura's been on the pod as well. That's like yes, two years yeah, ago yeah. now, which is mad. Yeah, it was ages ago, yeah, for uh Giddy Stratospheres, the movie. Yeah, yeah. Were you in yeah, that, yeah? I was, yeah. Um, in it very briefly. Yeah, I um, remember. I, yeah. I play the barman in it. <laughs> it was my uh, my first, only, and quite possibly last experience of acting. <laughs> did you know Laura before that film, then, or did it kind of like? Yeah, I mean, I've known Laura for oh god, I mean, probably since about two thousand and three, probably around the time Black Wire started. I think. Oh, okay. Because oh, cool. we, um, we, when we started, we were playing a lot in London, um, pretty much straight away. Um, and Laura's down here doing club nights and um, her own band and stuff, so sort of paths crossed. Ah, nice one, yeah. Yeah, you're a uh, do you have like a joint birthday party or something? That looked pretty cool. Um, no, that was uh, it was it, what was it? No, it it was it was Laura's birthday, but it was I think it was like a Laura's birthday and a Christmas party for the Giddy cast and crew. Uh, okay, so they right. rolled into one. Yeah, yeah, it was ace. It's really good. <laughs> um, and just remembering stuff from when I spoke to Dan. Am I right in mm. thinking? Did he say you're from Derby? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I mean, I I say Derby. I'm not actually from the city of Derby. I'm from a, a small town called Summercoats, which right. is just outside of Derby, which, um, I mean, have you ever been to Derby? Do you know it at all? Recently been for a wedding, so I went out. Yeah. We actually ended up um, going out after the wedding to some really rough bar, but yeah. Yeah, it's <laughs> fucking shit, isn't it? <laughs> well, it's like, like a, a decent, like, it's a bit like Hull, like there's a bit of it that's like a bit like old towny kind of thing that's all right. Yeah. Um, I, I, don't, I mean, I, th- I think Hull, uh, the last time I went to Hull was probably about four or five years ago, but I think Hull has got a bit more cultural cachet to it. Um, yeah, well. Derby's got this 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 sort of like heavy air of like 1993 about it. Like all calendars <laughs> stopped in Derby in 1993. But what I was going to say was, so I'm from this place called Summercoats, and so if you can imagine how awful Derby is this place is like even worse you know it's um it it sounds unfair of me it's like it off but I'm from there so fuck it I'll say <laughs> yeah I feel the same about Hull a little bit even though yeah it's a bit love hate I suppose um but yeah like going to Leeds I think I remember the story did Dan literally meet you on a dance floor dancing to 80s matchbox yeah so um yeah, it was it's as as rom- romantic as, uh, <laughs> as 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 he said. There was um, there was this amazing tour um, at the time. This would have been two thousand and 
2002, I think. Yeah, 2002. Um, his 80s matchbox, uh, the Parkinson's, and I think um, Ikara Colt. Um, and they were doing like this sort of package tour. Um, and I went down to that um, with a couple of friends, one of whom was uh, Nick Scott, who you might have heard of. He did all of the Cribs artwork mm. and put on loads of amazing nights in Leeds. Uh, so me and him went down to that and um, the, the Parkinson's were on. And I don't know if you ever saw the Parkinson's. I've heard, doing... heard a lot about them, like Spanish yeah. punks or something. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Okay. Um, I think oh, Port- I think they're Portuguese. Portuguese, right? Yeah, just to, you know, let's just, just <laughs> not getting cancelled. Um, yeah. yeah, well, exactly. Um, and the singer, I, I don't know if he was like he was covered in like baby oil or there was, he was covered in some kind of fluid, and he was throwing himself around and he was sort of on the dance floor riding around, and I thought it was amazing. And quite clearly, Sai and Dan did too because everybody else was sort of like pushed back almost like to, to the back of the wall like they were at a Gigi Allen concert uh, us three were just like jumping about and having loads of fun <laughs> yes and I mean I've, I've only got good memories of Leeds like at that time or when I was going out anyway like how good was it to go to uni there kind of thing yeah it was amazing I think um, again going back to sort of like where I'm from it was it, I can't sort of over, like over egg how amazing it was to be living in a big metropolitan city that was modern and up to date. Um, it, it was fantastic because so growing up, so I, I moved there when I was 18 um, and growing up, I'd never really got to go to many gigs because they were in places like Sheffield and Nottingham. They were probably the closest to me you know nobody ever went to derby even um so it would always be a real sort of trek and mission to go to gigs and then all of a sudden i'm in a city where i can go to a gig every night if i want um and just being around sort of like-minded people you know i think everybody who comes from a small town who's got any sort of creative ambition um at some point in their life kind of feels like the odd one out and that they don't necessarily see their sort of future there um, and so when you get the chance to go and uh, do something and be around like-minded people it's just a revelation you know yeah yeah yes and yeah just in terms of of the music and stuff uh, it's obviously a bit different did you always want it to be a bit bit different to what was going on or, or was there similar stuff in Leeds at that at that point um d- there wasn't, no. I mean, somebody will probably put a message somewhere saying, you're full of shit, you've got it completely <laughs> wrong. But as far as I can remember, um, there wasn't any bands in Leeds, per se, that sounded like we wanted to sound, which makes it sound really calculated. You know, it's like we sat down and said, right, we're going to sound like this, you know, we're, we're going to, we're not going to have a drummer. We're going to have a drum machine and stuff. All that just came about by chance, you know. Sai had got a drum machine, um, uh, like a multi-track with a drum machine built into it that we could create um, beats on and record onto. And we, the only person we knew who um, had a drum kit and who could play was Nick Hodgson. But he was in Parva at the time, Parva being the band that was, you know, that bore Kaiser Chiefs. Okay. Uh, so, so he was busy. He'd got his hands full doing that. How did um, you know him? Is it just from going out and stuff? Yeah, uh, just from going to gigs. Um, Ricky was on the same course as me at uni. He was um, a couple of years above me at uni. Uh, okay. Um, yeah. So, like, uh, yeah, I met Nick in a pub, um, and initially, it's quite funny. I'd like. I don't really know how many people know this, but uh, so uh, initially Nick was going to write a load of songs for me and a couple of friends and put a band together. No way. <laughs> so he, I, I think he's, he wants to be the songwriter and kind of puppet master and stuff. And I was like, well into this idea. I thought it was brilliant. You know, like I'd never been in a band before. I'd never, at this, at this point that we're talking about, I'd never even picked up an instrument. 
So somebody's asking me to be in a band, right? And it's like, well, yeah, of course I'm going to do that. Like, <laughs> it's the greatest idea ever. I can't write songs. You're a great songwriter. So, yeah, let's do it. But that never came to fruition. Um, and instead, what we did was start a club night called Pigs, which was like the second best thing to do in oh, this okay. band, you know. Um, yeah, so that's how I met Nick. Um, but going back to the drum machine thing. So, yeah, we, did, we didn't know anyone who had a drum kit apart from Nick. And then we kind of figured, well, we don't fucking want a drummer anyway, you know, um, <laughs> because but we, we never did it because we thought, we were never like, you know what, this is going to make us sound so individual. You know, no one's going to sound like this. It was just, it was out of necessity, really. Yeah, he just wanted to get out there kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And uh, to the point where I think we'd been rehearsing for about three months and then we booked our first gig, like, because we, we, we just wanted it to be so immediate. We wanted everything to sort of just start straight away because we didn't know how long we were going to, you know, sit around writing songs for. We had to go out and actually do it. Yeah, yeah. And how how would you write songs? How did they come about? Um, well, the only person in Black White that had, had any musical experience before was Sai. Um, I think he he went to college for about six months and did a music course. Which, I mean, I don't know how much I taught him, um, if anything, but he was just a naturally gifted uh, guitar player um, and songwriter anyway. Um, I mean, to this day, I mean, look, I don't know, I still don't know a great deal about what makes a musician brilliant. But I do know that size guitar playing sounded like nothing else um, that I knew of, at least around at the time. So Sai um, initially would write uh, pretty much all the music. He'd, for the first, I don't know, the first sort of like four or five, maybe six songs we had, he'd write my bass parts for me and show me how to play them. Like He wouldn't go, oh, this is like, um, a, this part's like a G minor, you know, and then it goes to this because I wouldn't have a fucking clue what he was talking about. He just simply pointed at the fretboard and go, put your finger there, play that one. And so we kind of just built it up like that. Um, but obviously that, you know, that can't really carry on throughout <laughs> your career and for the mm. listeners at home I am doing the sort of finger quotes when I say career um, <laughs> and so uh, we all kind of like um, it got to the point where we're all sort of bringing ideas to the table yeah yeah yes and then yeah it's going back to this pigs night then so you started that night right <laughs> <laughs> story okay, coming so well, yeah, I mean, uh, right, so th there's a pub in uh, Headingley in Leeds and um, Nick and Ricky uh, called this sort of summit of friends in this pub. And I remember it really clearly. Nick had got this scrapbook and he'd got loads of cuttings from different magazines and there was um, some pages that were ripped out of Face magazine. Um that was detailing uh, they'd done a feature on trash uh, you know Errol's night in yeah. London um, and he was like we, we should do something like this because there's there's nothing like this it's like we, we're all in agreement you know we we should um, and so Nick Ricky um, a guy called Ash Polakowski and Nick Scott who I mentioned before uh, they'd all DJ at the night, and I uh, I made all the flyers um, for the night. But it's funny because some like <laughs> you see this retrospective thing about pigs, and it's always it's always somebody else that started the night. You know, it's like I started, I started. It. Collectively, it was all together. You know, okay. It doesn't matter what anybody else says. <laughs> and, 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 it, and I'll tell you something if anybody puts any comments under any of these things when you put it out saying that's not true just delete them just delete them <laughs> yeah. so like 
I mean, I don't think I ever. What? How long was it going for? Pigs. Yeah. Um, it it went on for quite a few years. Um, okay. I think it, it must have gone on for about five or six years. Uh, I might have ended up there um, at one point then. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, it the first the first two years or the first eighteen months were kind of like the really exciting part, I suppose. Because like I say, there weren't anything like that in Leeds at the time. There, there, there were there were indie clubs, um, but you'd go and you'd just be listening to the same shit that everyone had been listening to for the past like 10 million years, you know what I mean? I'm not slagging off like Stone Roses and all that kind of thing, but it, it was that. Mm. And with Pigs, it, it was so current. It was like, if a record, you know, if, if a limited edition seven inch from some obscure New York band came out into the into Jumbo, the record shop, on the Monday, then someone was playing it on the Wednesday at Pigs. Um, and I think what it kind of did was, I think the reason it was so popular was because there were so many people waiting for this kind of thing to happen. So I remember the first night, we were kind of like, is you know, we've got no sort of gauge of how popular it's going to be. The, the club that we did it in, the Hi-Fi Club, I think it's like 450 capacity, which doesn't sound like a lot. But when you're doing something new, you're like, well, if 10 people turn up, yeah, yeah. we're going to say that's a success. Because <laughs> 10 people have turned up, but it's not really. Um, but it was packed from the first night. And it was really strange because... It was, people were turning up dressed to what was essentially an indie club still, but dressed so differently to what they had been previously. And it's not like that had come from us. It, it, these, you know, all these kids were waiting for that to happen anyway. They'd got, they'd been out maybe the past year since that first um, enemy New York issue came out. And since then, they'd probably been going and buying clothes, but not having anywhere to wear them. And then suddenly there was this place. So, yeah, it, it was it was really exciting. But I think it's important to point out as well that this was happening all over the country in sort of university cities, kind of around the same time. Um, there was Cold Rice in Birmingham. There was Liars Club in Nottingham. And, you know, you know loads more as well. So everyone, there seemed to be this sort of collective consciousness of, of change within, um, uh, sort of like this this non mainstream um, popular culture. Yeah, yeah, yes. And would you put bands on there? Was it just like DJs? Yeah, um, we we put bands on sporadically. I think the first band we put on was Future Heads. Oh wow! Um, and I've I've got a feeling it was it might have been there. First gig out of Newcastle. They are from Newcastle, aren't they? Uh, Sunderland, I think. Sunderland, sorry. I've got a feeling it might have been their first gig out of Sunderland. Um, we put uh, Pink Grease played. Um, yeah, yeah. I can't remember. Black Wire played, obviously, it was our first gig. Um, you know, we kind of gave ourselves the first <laughs> yeah, gig. Yeah. But that's, that's the privilege you get. Um, ARE Weapons. Do you know ARE uh, Weapons yeah, from New I York? That name, yeah. They played. Like, I have got no idea how they, I think it was Ash that booked them. I've no idea how they got booked, but they turned up and there's, I think there was just two of them. There was meant to be three. One of them didn't turn up uh, for some reason. And they got all their music on, uh, you remember Zip, Zip Discs? Yeah, it's yeah. Big, so they got all their backing tracks on Zip Discs and uh, <laughs> Their zip drive had, had like melted somehow. Right. I think I think they'd not used like the power converter from US to UK voltage. Anyway, that kind of like sort of melted, and they sent. So they, I think again, I think it was actually sent him out to like Bradford or Wakefield or something to like a Maplins because it was the only place that was open. <laughs> this was like half an hour before they were meant to be on stage. Um, but since they'd arrived at the club, they'd just been drinking whiskey continuously. Um, and then the, the 
pretty much the first thing the singer did was like fall off a stage flat on his face. Right. So yeah, I mean, it, great gig. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was good. Yeah, yeah, yes. And I was going to say, yeah, I've got to ask what I didn't ask Dan about it. So just a story. You mentioned the Kaiser Chiefs. Just a story mm. about um, I predict a riot story. Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah. Um, so let me just. I'm trying to think what times this would have been. 2003, sort of early mid mid 2003 maybe. Um, and we'd been we'd done a tour. We'd done like. Um, this totally DIY. So people talk about DIY. They ain't got a fucking clue for that. <laughs> we uh, we did this tour um, across the UK where we'd got enough dole money to get a train ticket to the first gig. And then the money from that gig would pay for the train ticket to the next gig and so on. Um, and so we'd done this tour and we'd come back and we were really hyped and we wanted to do a gig. So we decided to do another gig at Pigs. Um, and it was great, and it was it was it was rammed, and I can't remember if people were going absolutely mad and crazy and hurling themselves about because the gig was amazing and they loved it, or if it's because the drum machine had broken, right. and like and people were sort of like throwing things. I can't remember, but people were starting to get on stage. Um, you know how they used to do around that time. It, it, it was sort of libertines and sort of started it hadn't they where it's like mm. we'll break down the barrier between the bands <laughs> and the fans it's like fuck that i'm in the band i'm on stage you're down there there's there's a gulf of separation i don't want you anywhere near me but anyway people had started getting on stage and the bouncers would get on stage to try and throw people off and they tried to throw me off the stage uh and i was like i'm in the band I've, I've, and they're like, you're not, you're not, you're just some other dickhead on stage. I'm like, <laughs> I am a dickhead on stage, right? But, but I'm also in the band. And then I got into a tussle with the bouncer uh, and he hit me. Um, I only had my pants, my underpants on at the time. Um, <laughs> nice detail. Uh, uh, yeah, I don't know how that had come about. But while all this was going on, uh, Nick turned to somebody in the club and he said we need to do something because i predict a riot right <laughs> and so he went home that night and he wrote the song i predict a riot but it's really important i think to point out because obviously this this sort of comes up quite a lot this you know this sort of story and i think it's it's important to clear up that the song isn't about us. it's not about black white it, it's just that title so <laughs> what, whatever he wrote in the rest of the song is about something else but that doesn't change that it's it's it is really ace to be a part of because of that it's a fantastic pop song isn't it yeah yeah and and to have a personal connection to something that um that is you know so well crafted and great it is brilliant yeah so even if it is just the title, and the title's the most important part anyway, right? Because <laughs> you know? that comes up in the chorus. Yeah, yeah. Now that's it, yeah. Um, then, yeah, you mentioned the libertines and stuff. and Yeah. Um, yeah, I think Dan said you'd literally get on the train with your gear to London to do these gigs. Yeah, we, we could do that because we didn't have a drummer, you know. Yeah, we just, yeah. We'd just put... The drum machine in a bag, just a carrier bag, like fucking Mark e. Smith with his bag of cans, <laughs> and and go off and play gigs. Um, but we could also do that because I mean we were all on the dole at the time, but there was this thing called New Deal for musicians around that time, um, which I think had something to do with Alan McGee. I think he mm. kind of like he done some sort of like work with government bods and organize it so that if you were a musician and you could prove you were doing gigs or recording or something like that you'd get an extra 25 no an extra 15 quid a week dole money uh, for strings and and things like that so it was it was a time where you could just like buy a train ticket 
not even really think about the cost because obviously train tickets are cheaper there uh, and just go off and, and do these things. And again, because all these clubs had popped up um, all over the country, there was always somewhere to play. And the great thing about being a DIY band, a DIY punk band, is that there's so many like-minded people out there that you've always got a floor to sleep on as well. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's uh, And then you play some gig where um, Peter just got a prison or something. I mean, how into the Libertines were you? Was it a big deal for you? Um, it was a weird one. When <laughs> when the Libertines first sort of, when well, I say came out, what, when they were first getting press, um, because they were on the cover of The Enemy before they'd put a single out, right? Yeah, I think so, yeah. And so... Uh, that that would have been 2001, I think. So this is before, this is a good 18 months before I'd met Dan and Sack or anything like that. Um, and <laughs> I actually wrote a letter to the enemy and it got, it got, I've got it somewhere. I, you know what? I should have, I should have found it before we started, but I wrote a letter to the enemy and it got printed and I was, I can't remember word for word what it was, but it was something to do with why are you um, sort of promoting this fucking turgid, like, band that's made <laughs> up of these, like, public school boys that are just, like, you know, pretending to slum it and stuff. So, yeah, I, I weren't into the lifting at all. Uh, and then, I don't know, I, I don't know why, I think it's because maybe I've just like because their their songs were like in other clubs and pubs all the time around that time. It was almost like they were in the atmosphere. But I ended up buying the album, the the, the first record. I ended up buying it, and and I played it quite a lot. And I and for a, for a short time, I enjoyed it. Um, but I think I I think we all. All three of us quickly kind of cottoned on to the fact that it was it was more it's, it, that band seemed to be more about this bizarre tabloid almost soap opera kind of thing, and and it just it it just became a bit vile. Mm. I thought you know there was. When I mean, we played with the Libertines a couple of times and Baby Shambles and stuff. And so the first time that you were on about when Pete had got out of prison, um, I think he'd got out of prison and he'd gone, he'd done that gig in Kent or something the day he'd got out of prison. And then the next night, um, we were playing the Barfly in London. Um, it was a Queen's of Noise night and, um, We'd sound checked and we're sitting around and all that. And then one of the Queens of Noise said, Oh, would it be okay if Pete Doherty came and did some acoustic songs before you guys went on? It's like, well, there's no point asking us because you've clearly already made this decision <laughs> and it's gonna happen. And I can see on this computer screen here that it's already on the Liberty's <laughs> message board. So obviously that's gonna happen. Um and so so Pete turns up and um, he's got an acoustic guitar with him. And then about half an hour later, the rest of the Libertines turn up. And it suddenly went from Pete doing a couple of songs acoustic on stage four, we went on, to what was going on early and the Libertines playing a full set. And there was, um, we got a phone call from one of them. I presume it was the drummer. Gary, because he's, he he rang up uh, someone and, pa and they passed the phone to us, and he said, "Can we borrow your drum kit?" And I said, "Ha, no, you can't, because you haven't got a drum kit." <laughs> thinking, thinking that that would sort of derail the whole night, and we could just do our gig, and our egos would be intact, kind of thing. Well, they, you know, it was Camden, and they managed to get a drum kit from somewhere. Um, it was. It was a really, really weird gig. So I don't know if you've have you ever seen a gig at Camden Barfly. So I mean, you must have done it some um, point. Yeah, I've definitely been drinking in there. It's, it's a yeah. small place, isn't it? It's absolutely tiny. Um, and as you can imagine, it was it was you know overfilled with people. And I remember watching the Libertines from the back of the stage, and I'd seen them a couple of times before, 
I'd seen them on their first tour uh, when they came to Leeds and stuff. And I was watching them and it, it was really strange. I've never never seen it before or since a band on stage that cl- every single one of them clearly hated each other so much. <laughs> it, was, it was like this horrible sort of toxic atmosphere. But the thing with uh, playing with those uh, guys um, and with Baby Shambles was the the this weird sort of entourage of people that were kind of like sort of floating around um, Pete because obviously you, because of drugs connection you know it's it's quite clearly that but people who just vibrated with some kind of like really malevolent horrible energy uh, and it just turned every room any room you walked into that they were in it, it just it was just sour. It was horrible. Oh, that's interesting, yeah. Um, yeah, you can imagine at some point it all got a bit weird, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was it was dark and it, it wasn't just dark like um it wasn't dark like the enemy initially wanted it to be. And I say that because you look at the people who were running the enemy at the time, they were all sort of um sort of public school, privately educated, you know, very sort of middle-class people who wanted um, to dabble in something exciting, you know, vicariously. And I'm not just saying it was the people at the enemy at the time. You look back to when the Happy Mondays came out and the, the, the Happy Mondays were kind of like taken on board as the enemy as their sort of working class plaything almost. And I think something similar happened a little bit with... Um, Pete Doherty in terms of it was all oh it's all very thrilling for all these <laughs> sort of like enemy people but then it got then it got real you know and and people who were very young were getting addicted to drugs very bad drugs um and people were dying you know I mean there's there's at least two people that you know it was high profile news stories that died. And it was that filmmaker Robin Whitehead and um the the guy whose name I unfortunately can't remember who um who was dropped from a, a window. Hmm. You know and these things don't just happen to bands, you know. This happens because of the influence of something else that's that's far more powerful. And that's that's heavy drugs and gangsters, you know. Mm. And I think it's, I don't know, it's, it might sound a bit sort of Mary Whitehouse and right on and a bit conservative with a small C of me um, to say, but I think the enemy kind of had a hand to play in all that because they did actively promote this drug use. Um, I remember... <laughs> A couple of years ago, I was at my parents' house and I was helping my mum shift a load of stuff and she kept all the enemies and all the magazines and all the stuff that we were in. And I was moving um, this box and I was looking through these old enemies and there was a, a Christmas issue. But you know how they, in the Christmas issues, they put all these lists like top albums of the year and all, you know, top mm. haircuts of the year or fucking whatever. And there was, there was one bit and it was like top quotes of the year. And there was um, this this photograph of um, someone from a band that wasn't the Libertine. So I'm not, I'll not say who it is. It's a bit lame to say who it is. But it was a photograph of them and they were in the top quotes of the year. And this person's quote was, uh, quote was, crack is fucking brilliant. Right? Wow. And it's like, you know, it's printed big and like, that's a quote of the year. This is a newspaper that, you know, that thousands and thousands of impressionable people are going to be reading. And you read a quote that says, crack is fucking great. And that's it. And it's a picture of this smiling dude like this. It's like, <laughs> fuck, they, they, there's, there's a, you know, there's a level of complicitness um, within all that horrible, nefarious scene that, um, that you know, came from magazines like The Enemy. Yeah, definitely. I remember asking Conor McNicholas about that, like whether mm. 
you know, he felt any kind of responsibility for... Right, okay. What did he say about that then? He basically said, no, nah, it's, it's kind of it, rock and roll's rock and roll type vibe, I think. Right, oh, yeah. I mean, but again, that's that's the kind of thing that someone would say that doesn't have to get the hands dirty and all that, you know. Mm. And then, you know, but then what did he care about rock and roll? Because then what did he do? You know, he, he sacked that job off and went to wear it fucking Men's and Motors or Top Gear magazine or something. It's just a greasy ladder for someone like him to climb, you know. I remember there was a time, I can't remember where, I think I was in Red. It was after Reading. It was like an after show party um, at this place. And I was sat with some friends um, on a table upstairs and Conor McNichols was there um, with a few other enemy journalists, uh, you know, all these fucking spotty students covered in like crisp crumbs and things like that, you know, hanging on his every word. And he was, he sat there and, and he said, um, what did he say? Oh, he said, the band, the 2220s will never feature in the enemy again. From now on, I'm only going to put bands in that have got good shoes and good haircuts. And it's like, I just fucking burst out laughing. It's like, what the fuck are you, what the fuck are you doing this for? I understand that you've got to sell papers. And I understand that the enemy is losing readers by thousands every week. And you've got to sort of like sex it up, you know, so to speak. But if that's your criteria, you've got to be asking yourself some serious fucking questions, haven't you? You know? Maybe that's why Good Shoes call themselves Good Shoes. Oh, I, I, I bet it is. I bet it is. Yeah, <laughs> there was there was a band from Leeds called The Hair as well. They'll have they'll have had that. <laughs> nice. <laughs> um. Oh. Yeah, I remember like at some point, um, there was like this. Ca- it was literally they made like a cartoon of all these characters around Peter Doherty, like right. Yeah, uh, in the enemy, it's like. I don't know if that was turning, it's like them turning the back on it and taking a piss out of them all. I don't know if yeah, that was like I, a turning point at some point. I don't know. I think, yeah, I, th- I think you're probably right. I think, I think you kind of hit the nail on the head a little bit. I think they realized, like I say, that it had all got a little bit out of control and they needed to distance themselves mm, I think you're from right, yeah. all this, you know, horrible shit that was going on. Um, you know, because also, let's not forget that the enemy also hyped and promoted. Gorilla gigs. I mean, for fuck's sake, like you know, promoting drugs and then promoting the others playing on a fucking tube or in a subway. <laughs> Two of the worst things you can promote. <laughs> Why? What's your problem with us specifically? Um, oh, but, oh the, no, there's there's nothing specific. It's it's just generally <laughs> <laughs> just not having them. No, not at all. No, <laughs> I mean you write a song called "This Is for the Poor." You know, have the poor not suffered enough already? <laughs> no, I mean Gorilla Gigs. Oh, Gorilla Gigs. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, I think I just think it's I think it's a major inconvenience for everyone. You know, yeah, that just wants to go about the daily lives. Yeah, I mean, imagine again, being on that tube would be annoying. Yeah, I, I know. Yeah, you'd. Uh, yeah. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> But I guess as a kid, you'd be loving it, I suppose, if you're into it. Um, yeah, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but a band you did have a good relationship with, like the Cribs. Um, yeah, yeah. It seemed like Kindred Spirits from early on type thing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'd seen it. It was really strange. I thought the first time I saw the Cribs was the first time we played with them at a, a Valentine's gig at Cardiff University in 2003. But not long ago, I think during lockdown, they put a video on um, their Instagram of when they played the comedy tent at Leeds Festival, which must have been like 2001 or something. Yeah, I watched that, I think. Yeah, yeah and I, I saw that and I realised I was there. I didn't see myself watching them in the video. But at the front of the stage, so it would have been the year M&M played, because at the front of the stage, there's, there's, there's two lads with, like, bleach blonde hair, like, sort of Marshall Mathers bleach blonde hair, and they were dressed like it. And I clearly remember, at that Leeds Festival, walking past the comedy tent and seeing two lads dressed like M&M. They think, oh, that's funny. 
well, I wonder what they're going to see. And then a band came on stage and I watched them for about five minutes. It was the Cribs. And it wasn't until, you know, what, I, God knows how many years later that I realised that it was the Cribs. You know? um, but, yeah, they I think they they really were kindred spirits. I think both us as Black Wire and the Cribs kind of felt a little bit out of step in I know they're from Wakefield, but within the Leeds scene, we've felt a little bit out of step because the bands that were around the music scene in Leeds at the time weren't really our kind of thing. We weren't their kind of thing. And we just felt like a band of misfits along with the Cribs. Uh, you know, our, our music doesn't sound particularly similar um, in any way. But I think whatever it was that we felt with the Cribs, whatever that sort of camaraderie and kinship was, um, our fans and the well, more predominantly the Cribs fans felt the same as well because the Cribs fans um, sort of adopted us, you know, quite quite warmly. Yeah, yeah, yes, um, and yeah, like get when you already talked about enemy and stuff, but mm. getting single of the week must have been a bit of a bit of a mad one. Excuse me. Uh, yeah, it. I mean, that was amazing. Um, it was the first, first record we put out, the first single we put out, the first recording any of us had been on, and it was a record we put out ourselves. Um, and up until that point, to get single of the week, you had to have like pretty heavyweight sort of uh, PR or a label or something like that behind you. And we didn't. We had, we had a PR guy called Andy Fraser um, who... Um, he was doing quite a few East London bands at the time. Um, even though we were based in Leeds, he he really like he'd seen us at a gig in London and said, "Oh, I'd love to work with you." Um, yeah, and we, we we weren't even expecting that first single to get reviewed anywhere. Um, and then it was single of the week. It, it, was, it was just a real shock, and it's something that I'm I'm incredibly proud of to this day. The fact that it got there not through a record label, not through sort of PR or radio plugging or anything like that. It just got there because enough people thought it was good enough, or at least one person who was doing sing- who was doing the singles that week thought it was good enough to be there, you know. And yeah. they I think in 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 the review they compared us um to Elastica as well, which which is really nice because they're one of my favourite bands. Yes. that was great yeah really good and how like can you tell how big an effect does that have do you like you immediately getting a lot more gig offers and stuff after that yeah uh, i think it, it happened the, the time that it happened for us if it had happened any later than that if we'd have got single of the week if we'd have put that record out maybe six or a year later the um the attention that we got wouldn't have been anywhere near as what we got because at this time everything was sort of changing so fast within not just within uh, the music industry but within the way people were consuming popular culture I mean that was single of the week that was the last single of the week after that in the enemy it was track of the week all right so it was taking into account downloads um, and things like that mm. um and this, so this was back when single of the week sort of meant something. Um, I think that that accolade had always meant something quite high within the history of the enemy. Um, and I think, yeah, like I say, I think if we'd have got it after that, I don't think it would have been as um, sort of. I was going to say profitable for us. It certainly wasn't profitable. That's not the right word. But it wouldn't have um, shone the spotlight on us in the same way that it that it did then. Yeah, yeah. And then I was looking at uh, Wikipedia today and I, I'd look at the Wikipedia for the album. Have you have you edited that by any chance? I've not seen it. What does it say? Let's have a look. <laughs> it says uh, it came out in, in the US on Giant Pecker Records. I'm assuming yeah. that's not... Is that a thing? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> is it a thing? <laughs> It, it it was a thing. Oh God! Right. Okay. Look. I, I'll, yeah. I'll give you the story because there's, there's the short answer is yes. It came out 
on a label called Giant Pecker Records, right? Right. What happened was there was a guy in America called Bob, right? And somehow Bob had got lots and lots and lots of money. And he had found a copy of the Hard to Love Easy LA single in a record shop in America. I haven't got a fucking clue how it got there, right? Um, because we had a distribution deal, but as far as I'm aware, it was for the UK and Europe. So maybe it had been imported. Anyway, this guy, Bob, <laughs> finds, finds this record in a shop. And then he goes back the next day because he liked he liked how to love easy LA so much. He went back the next day and he bought the other two copies in there because he didn't want anyone else to have them. <laughs> right. Which is which is kind of like a bit of a Hollywood fairy tale kind of thing. You know, it's like I like this band so much, I don't want anyone else to hear them. A bit like when Alfred Hitchcock made Psycho and the book that it's based on, he went out and he got people within his sort of um cottery to go out and buy all the copies of these books so nobody could get it so he could make a film of it right. now it's not the same as psycho because that's incredibly <laughs> popular um but yeah he went and bought these other two copies so nobody else could get them and then he emails us uh or he emails our manager in the uk and said i want to manage this band and i want to put the record out in america and within two weeks he'd flown over to leeds um and he was sort of like staying with us, and like he was giving it the the big uh, "I'm gonna make you a star" <laughs> and all that kind of thing. Um, and yeah, you know, I'm not I'm not slagging him off. He was he was an absolute sweetheart. He was lovely. He's brilliant. Um, and yeah, so he didn't want to. Um, he wanted to take you on, but he didn't want to shop around for a record deal for us straight away so he said i'll put it out i'll pay to put the uh put your singles out in america and potentially put the album out and we're like okay that sounds great let's do that you know there is no point shopping around for a deal in america because you know we're just this tiny band so he's like right i'll put it out i'm gonna i'm gonna start a record label <laughs> i'm gonna start a record label and put it out we're like fucking great do it and then about a month later uh we got an email from Bob at Giant Pecker Records. And we're like, who the fuck's this? Like, Hang on, this is, this is American Bob. And he's only gone and called his record label Giant Pecker Records. <laughs> like, it, it, it couldn't be more spinal tap, you know. Like, you're looking at your record and it says fucking Giant Pecker on it. <laughs> like, Christ almighty, you know. Yes. It's just because, like, on the Wikipedia as well, it says... um Acts, oh no, that might be an actual instruction. So it's on about a secret track called Brain Dead. Yeah. It says, um, access to the song is gained by holding the rewind button of a CD player at the start of the first track. Yeah, mate, this is like... Until there is silence when the song can be heard. Yeah. (laughs) So I I got this idea from, uh, you know, the band Ash. Mm. Uh, In their first album, 1977, right? And... I remember getting that album as a kid and somebody at school telling me that if you rewind the CD from track one, there's a secret track before that start. And he's right, there was. Right, right? okay. And it's it's something to do with digital marking where the laser um, is, you know, picks up the first track or whatever. Uh, so, yeah, we, we decided to do that. So there's a track called, if you've got a CD, version i think it's only on the british one so if, if any if anybody out there has got it on giant pecker records it might not work <laughs> but if you've got it on the uk um version yeah you can rewind it and you can hear brain dead yes um who did you record that with who produced it the album um it was a guy called chuck hussein um, okay uh, from leeds he'd been in um he'd been a, a big part of sort of like the Leeds music scene for years. He was um he was in a band called the Hollow Men, um in which I think was sort of like early nineties and eighties he was in a band called Salvation. Um and he then in the in the mid to late nineties in in a band called Black Star Liner. Um and he saw us um at a gig at the cockpit in Leeds and uh 
he just came up to us afterwards and said, you're amazing. You're the visual equivalent of a human screaming. <laughs> and he's like, I want to make a record with you. And he's like, right, let's do it. You know, it's great. Uh, yeah. Uh, and again, like working with Chop was brilliant. None of us have been in a recording studio before. And we're, I think it's fair to say we're all really nervous, but he, he was brilliant. And he spent a lot of time sort of nurturing what we were as a band in the studio. So I've got a lot of respect for that guy. Mm, quality. Um, and then got a memory of Dan saying 48 Crash. Is that something you created to get the record out? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, okay. Again, because. Like, like with doing that first gig where we just wanted to do it, we're like, we didn't, uh, it wasn't that we didn't have the patience to wait around. It's just that we knew what we wanted to do. And if we can use those means and build that sort of structure ourselves, then let's do it rather than get other people involved. Now, that sounds like an incredibly sort of idealistic sort of punk DIY thing to do. And it is, but it's not necessarily the most um it's not necessarily the best way to um sort of uh promote yourselves within the industry because within the industry you need people who are known within the industry so that other industry people listen to them but that's by the by we're a diy punk band so it don't matter <laughs> yeah yes how 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 cost effective is it? Is it easy to fund, like producing your own record? Well, this this is the thing. I have, I don't know really where the money came from to do it. Okay. Um, there was, I, I I mean I think Chuck may have put some money in himself, um, and our manager at the time, Steve, he would have done a Bob, obviously just shoveled loads of money into oh, it. I mean, we went we went to America for three weeks promoting a record that wasn't even out in America. <laughs> you know what I mean? On 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 this guy's dollar. So yeah, the the, the money kind of uh came to us somehow, but I can tell you for certain none of us put his hands in his pocket because if we did <laughs> there'd have been nothing there anyway, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean I remember Dan saying he played you played at some high school in America or something. Yeah, that was, yeah, that was really good. So, um, Bob, our manager, lived in a place called Oswego in uh, Chicago, Illinois, and um, we'd got a bit of time off between some gigs, and we were staying at his house over there. Then we decided we, we wanted to do a gig, um, and there were some like sort of clubs and and venues around. Um, but I don't know whose idea it was. It, it might have even been Dan's idea. I can't remember. Um, we decided to do it at, at his kid's high school in, <laughs> the, in the sort of band auditorium. Um, and it, to this day, it's my favorite gig we've ever played. It was, it was, it was so pure and brilliant and seeing kids of sort of like all ages there. I mean, th th this was, there were some kids there that were experiencing not just their first gig ever, but like their first punk rock gig. And it was so funny because you could tell that some just didn't really know what to do or how to act. So they just sort of went crazy, which is obviously what you should do at a punk rock gig. You know, you should <laughs> do whatever it is that that environment is making you feel. Um, it was brilliant, but we we were told by not just by the school, but by the police, the, the caps over there, that we weren't allowed to play uh, Hard to Love, Easy to Lay. Um, because I think they, I mean, you know, quite rightly, they thought it was about uh, sexual intercourse. It's not, as far as I'm aware, it's not. <laughs> um, but they thought it was. And they said we couldn't, we, well, the specific language within the contract was we couldn't sing that song live on stage um and so it got to the end of the gig and i turned to science i just triggered the backing track <laughs> hard, a lot. let's just fucking do it anyway and there's cops at the side of the stage like a fucking doors gig or something and so we played it but we but dan didn't sing it dan got bob's young son uh, on stage yeah, and gave him the mic 
and uh, let him sing it. And yeah, it was great. You know, was, yeah, absolutely brilliant. And then we were on the cover of the local paper the next day. <laughs> yeah, I was just looking at that on Instagram. Yeah. Rock and Roll High School. Yeah, that's the one. <laughs> yeah, that's this. Um, and Dan was saying, like, remember him saying you bumped into, um, what's the fella from Brian Jones Town called? Anton. That's the one, yeah. Yeah. He's like um, inviting you back to his house for a Sunday dinner or something. Yeah, it was really weird. We went to the, <laughs> we're in New York and we went to this bar called 2A. Um, and we went there because we'd read about it um, in Sleaze mm-hmm. Nation or something. That Apparently that's where the strokes hung out. So we went there, like, going, oh, we're going to meet the strokes. The strokes are going to be in there and we're going to be best friends with them and we're going to go on tour with them and do a like, split seven inch with them. And oh, so we walked in, there was, it was fucking empty. There was no one there apart from this one dude at the bar sat hunched over on his own. So we go up to get a drink and, uh, he looks up like that and he goes, you guys are in a band. <laughs> and I look around and I went, you're in a band as well. And yeah, it was Anton from Brian Jones Town Massacre. And um, he was absolutely lovely. He was a, <laughs> had, we had a really nice night with him. He was really friendly, really courteous, uh, really interested in what we were doing. Uh, yeah, absolutely sound. Yeah, yeah, excellent. Yeah. It was a good trip, that American trip was. Apart from the first gig, we, we were playing in San Francisco um, for the first gig, and we got there, and they were like, the venue owners go, oh, you, you're the support band, right? And we're like, no, 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 this is, we're, we're Black Wire, this is, <laughs> we're Black Wire, this is our gig. <laughs> we're Black Wire, no, 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 this is our gig. He said, no, 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 we've got you down here as a support band. And, so, and we're like, all right, okay, fair enough. And we're like, who are supporting? He goes, ah, oh, um, it's it's another English band. I'm like, all oh, right, okay, who is it? And he goes, hard fire. I'm like, for fuck's sake, <laughs> I've come all the way to the other side of the world to do a tour in America. Mm-hmm. Like, in the first fucking place we're playing, we're playing with goddamn hard fire. <laughs> oh, that's funny. <laughs> didn't, watch, didn't watch him. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then... Yeah, this thing about um, you and Dan making it your mission to uh, <laughs> get pop stars to get you in headlocks. Yeah, that that was that was a thing that um, we were doing at the time. I, I mean, I don't know why it got <laughs> it got nothing to do with making music or anything like that. Um, some people were fairly, you know, genial about it. Uh, one of the guys from the the big fella from Junior Senior, I presume it was Senior from Junior Senior. <laughs> he loved it. He was all over it and. Um, the kid from My Parents Are Aliens and uh, oh, yeah. all these other bands, um, apart from Noel Gallagher, who told us to fuck off. Yeah, and I, you know, and you know what? I'm I'm glad he did because um, the guy over. I mean, he's he's always been a bit of a dick, but the past few years he's become insufferable. You know? <laughs> so I'm glad that there there isn't a photograph in existence of me stood next to him, let alone with him, with me in a headlock. <laughs> you know? Did you ask Debbie Harry as well on reading that? Yeah, I think so. I think we asked Debbie Harry. I've got a feeling uh, we asked Doc Cotton as well. Um, like, I can't, I'm sorry, I can't remember her name, the actress who plays uh, Doc Cotton. June Brown. That was it, yeah. yeah. So that was, I think that was about half an hour before we asked Noel um, at Glastonbury. And she kind of like looked at us and sort of, said sorry what and then I just felt a bit embarrassed it's like uh, you know it's fucking Doc Cotton like just leave her alone let her get on <laughs> what she's doing and it's like oh you know so I'm sorry to bother you we're, we're just gonna go somewhere else now <laughs> yeah the Glastonbury stuff sounded hilarious to be fair yeah no it was, it was really good yeah yeah um all right I'll uh just get these questions involved that people have sent Mm. Um, <laughs> let's have a look. So, so TNE, I can't even say it. He asked a lot of questions, but I can never pronounce his username. TNEF Uts. Uh, but what? Black Wire had three female, female fans for every male fan. Discuss. I don't know if you want to comment on we that. Had, or not, we, really. we had We had what? 
Black Wire had three female fans for every male fan. Colon oh, discuss. Oh, right, okay, right, okay, fair enough. I thought it said Black Wire had three ma- female fans and one male fan, which, <laughs> to be fair, wouldn't be far off. <laughs> um, uh, uh, right, so they're saying that our fans were predominantly female. Yeah, yeah. Um, Is that a fair assessment? Or? I mean, yeah. I, I don't. I, I mean, I don't know if the degree. I don't know if the percentage was that largely skewed, but we, we, I think we definitely had, on average, more um, girls at our gigs than some other bands. And I mean, I can't really speculate on why that is, but I think I think one of the things was we as three individuals on stage, I think we're all three very vulnerable people and we were never really like laddie and we never really encouraged that kind of like laddie atmosphere that you get with a lot of bands. You know, if you think about something like fucking Pigeon Detective, right? <laughs> and it's all sort of like football chants and beer, we are the lads and all that kind of thing. It was, it, it was never that. And I, I don't know if that, sort of atmosphere was more conducive to people feeling more comfortable uh, coming to one of our gigs. I don't know. I mean, it's probably unfair of me to speculate because I'm just, you know, just another guy. You probably have to, have to ask some female fans about why that was. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I can imagine, like, taking the drums away has a big effect. I don't know. I can imagine it's like, it makes it more accessible to other, other people for some reason. Yeah, maybe. I mean, it, yeah, taking the drink. Yeah, it certainly doesn't make it accessible when you go to somewhere like Warrington and you've got a load of fucking meters going, <laughs> why aren't you a proper band? Where, where's your drummer? Where's your drummer? And all that. It's like, okay, where's yeah. your band? You can't. <laughs> I remember Dan mentioning this. I couldn't believe it. He's like, oh, yeah, people would like just quite happily have a go at it for not having, a, for not having drums. Yeah. I was like, fucking hell. Some, some people just didn't get it whatsoever. You know, that. It, I mean, again, I can't, I can't speculate why. Maybe, maybe some people are just thick. You know, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, no, that's unfair. I think um, it's probably that I British think, thing in it where, like, they think you're trying to be different, so they've got to knock you down. Yeah, I, I, there's def- there's definitely some of that in it, um, and I think there's, I think something that the British really, really strive for is authenticity. In things, uh, I, I mean, I do myself. Um, you know, Blackwire are, are an authentic band, but I think when you've had it for so long, where I'm not saying that we invented the drum machine and we were the first band to use it, but when you've had popular music for so long, where it is four lads, bass, guitar, singer, and drummer playing, you know, what is essentially punk rock music. And and you change that, and you bring in an element that's from another genre of music. It can probably skew people's um, sort of, you know, the, the identity that they have with with music. Mm. If that makes sense, probably. No, I know you mean. Yeah. 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 Um, and then the same person asks, uh, "Was it difficult ending Black Wire to then start televised crime with?" What was that process like, and how do you reflect on the latter as a group now? Mm. Um, well, when Black Wire ended, it was very abrupt in terms of it was there one day, and then the next day it wasn't there. Um, there wasn't a sort of big discussion about it. Um, it just, yeah, I mean, yeah, it. That that the ending of Black Wire itself was really difficult um, for me uh, because it it was all in it was all consuming in my life. It was everything. You know, you wake up, you did this thing. This is what you do, and then all of a sudden it's not there. But I think the big worry came that the three of us were so close as friends. Like we we were so so close as friends. Uh, the worry was that that friendship wasn't going to be there anymore. Thankfully, I can say that wasn't the cause for concern. Um, we're still really close. Uh, we still love each other very much. Um, but to stop doing Black White and then do another band, 
um, I don't really know how to describe it. I guess it's kind of like falling off a ladder and rather than sort of like letting yourself hit the bottom and see what happens, you kind of like grabbing to sort of carry on. So we carried on doing music because that's all I sort of knew, um, which which sounds really melodramatic, uh, but I, I, I can't really articulate it in a different way. Um, but the positive thing was that, uh, you know, I, I love being in the band. It, it, the whole process of making music and everything was very different to Black Wire. Um, the whole process of just existing in that band was very different to Black Wire. Um, and I don't think it's really fair to compare the two in, in any way. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I look back at the stuff we did in Televised Crime Wave and, and yeah, I still love it. It's great. Yeah, yeah. Um, what was the main like catalyst for you for your breaking up Black Wire? Um, yeah, I mean, it wasn't, uh, I mean, it wasn't my decision to break up okay. Black Wire, so I don't really want to. Yeah, fair play, mate. Yeah, probably uh, because I don't really know. <laughs> uh, yeah, but I remember Dan talking about that. Like, you know, it's part of your identity, so like, it's a, yeah. a, weird, a weird time. Did you? And, yeah. Uh, televised crime was that? Did you both move down to London for that? Yeah. Um, well, with Dan had Dan and Side moved down to London um, to. Uh, while we were still in Black Wire, and I was sort of in the process of moving, and then then Black Wire stopped. Um, so Televised Crime was a purely sort of like London based band. You know, there was no there was no lead connection there at all. Mm. Yeah, but it was. I mean, what was really good um, was when in 2013, when the Cribs asked us to get back together um, to just do one night with them at Christmas at Cribsmas. Um, and they asked Black Wire if we'd reform and do that and it was great because it was the perfect amount of time between Black Wire stopping and doing that and it wasn't too far away where we were so old and decrepit that we couldn't do it and it was just it, it was it was so lovely and um, just to be back on stage um, with that collective of friends again you know it, it was like the perfect kind of like that's it. It's done. Yeah, Great. yeah and it'll it. never happen again. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, a few people did ask about that. If you're going to play any more shows in the future, no. Um, for several reasons. One, it's just it's not geographically viable. I'm in London. Dan is in Leon C in Essex, which isn't a million miles away. But Sai um, is in Helsinki. Oh, okay, um, right. So, uh, and Dan and Sai are now. Uh, both very happy sort of fathers so that's uh, taking up a lot of a lot of their time and also it's like who's got the fucking energy to be reforming do you know what i mean <laughs> it's like who can who can be bothered <laughs> <laughs> plus i'll tell you what's funny since we broke up i've had more people asking me if black wire will get back together and do gigs than they were at the gigs when we were together so if they didn't want it then, it's certainly not fucking having it now. <laughs> I know what you mean about the, like how can you be asked stuff. Like my mate, the the kid who was a drummer in my band has just started another band, and um, mm. it, like sounds, what are they called? Uh, they're called Paper, which uh, right, is, okay. an, is an interesting right. one. I mean, I I like it as a band name. <laughs> it is fucking utterly ungoogleable. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but... you've, got, you've got to worry about those things these days, haven't you? You know, you've got to worry about where your, um, you know, where your Google landing is and and stuff like that. You know, where you are in the hierarchy of searches. Yeah, yeah. I remember uh, Mess from Life saying <clears throat> you get half regrets calling them life because of that reason. Yeah, I, but, I, yeah. I mean, I can, I can completely understand, but. What Mez from Life has got to remember is that Life is one of the best fucking band names ever. <laughs> yeah. So whether you can Google it or not, it doesn't matter because it's still probably the best band name I've ever heard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was just going to say, like, uh, yeah, the idea of starting a band now it just seems like a lot of effort. The idea of, like, yeah. carry, carrying amps around and stuff, like, fuck <laughs> Yeah, I think it depends what you want to do. I mean, I've... I've 
the world of, of being in a band, operating as a band, creating music, doing gigs, um, and having that as your identity is so far removed from what I knew. Uh, it seems so difficult now, you know. Imagine like trying to tour Europe as a young band now. You can't, you can't afford it because you've got to pay innumerable fees. You get assigned to a label and they're not only wanting you to go on tour and make music, but they're also asking you to sell T-shirts, which they're going to take God knows what percentage of profit from. Mm. And then they're asking you to make content for social media, you know. You've got, you've got, you know, you've got to keep your social media content. Oh, you've got to keep it fresh. It's like, what, what's that got to do with <laughs> anything? It, it baffles me. And I know that's, that makes me sound like a really old man, um, but it just seems, I don't know. It, it almost seems like quite an old fashioned way of doing it, really. Like in the past when you'd uh, have bands going on like, a, you know, doing press junkets, they'd, in the 90s, 80s, 90s, you know, 70s, 80s, 90s, they'd fly bands out to Europe for two weeks to travel around just doing press, not even playing gigs, you know. So this idea of now having to create content for social media is a bit like that, this sort of like antediluvian sort of concept, but shifted into the modern sort of, you know, framework I, I just think it's yeah just just talking about it makes me tired i'm i'm, I'm tired i'm boring myself <laughs> talking about it um yeah just that's the second album just want uh i was listening to it today i was enjoying it oh yeah 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 um but what yeah did that what was the reason like, how was that recorded and why did it not come out initially well it's it's funny that um the album which is on Bandcamp and how do I make this louder you can go and buy it <laughs> right um, it's, it's it's essentially all demos of songs that were going to be in the second album ah, so, okay, right. uh, but the, they are high quality demos so it is worth you know 10 quid of anyone's money or you know what you're willing to pay um, and uh, so that that was you know effectively the second album Um but we never got to the point where we got into the studio. The band sort of ended before we got into the studio to record it properly. Mm. But I'm still really, I mean, the, the the tracks that we put up, the, the album, the, the version of the album, something I'm incredibly proud of. I absolutely love it. Um, and I think it's quite interesting as well. I mean, other people, you know, probably wouldn't notice or anything, but to me, it's like, it's such a dark record compared to the, um, compared to the first one no yeah, it's definitely different yeah i mean um, that's what that's that's what i think other people listen to it probably good it's just more of the fucking same <laughs> <laughs> did you record that with the same guy no that was called recorded with uh i think there's about three or four different people we recorded with uh oh, okay. for that because like i say it's all demos um so it was recorded with lots of lots of different people yeah um yeah so is it like when did the album come out? Two thousand and five. Would you consider? Yeah. Do you reckon you'd do like a reissue or anything like that? Do buy album? it. <laughs> I don't know. Well, people, I mean, look, people are asking that anyway. Are they? How many? Well, <laughs> someone asked. ELW twenty twenty two said twenty year reunion shows pending. So obviously they're saying that's not happening. So I've kind of switched yeah, it up a little happening. bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's definitely not happening. Um, I mean, look if. If somebody wanted to reissue that record, um, then absolutely, yeah, of course. I, you know, I think, I think we, I think we'd all do it. And I think, and if somebody is listening that wants to do it, I'll tell you what, we'll throw in the second album as well. We'll do a two disc deal, <laughs> and you can put the second album out within that one as well. You know, yeah. I, I, I think it'd be nice. I'd like it because I'd like a copy. I don't even have a copy of the record. You know, okay. Yes. I, I would, probably just give it away by showing off to somebody or something <laughs> that looked quite cool actually like a double like a double gate fold with two albums. it would wouldn't it there we go you know we sold one already look <laughs> yeah I feel like fucking del boy doing this <laughs> <laughs> um going from marv from the panettons oh yeah yeah Sn <laughs> snog mario void <laughs> uh crested a dick 
Theresa May, Suella Braverman. Fucking hell. And you can't um, take yourself out, he says. Yeah, I can't. <laughs> um, so it's not Mario, but who was it? Sorry, Christina Dick. Theresa Suella May. Braverman. Yeah. Um, I'll snog all of them. <laughs> Good answer. Uh, Paprika Jones on Instagram. Mm-hmm. What would it What would it take to readopt this vibe? Oh right, okay. So that was in reference to the picture I posted of yesterday. Oh right, okay. Um, what, what would it take to readopt it... this vibe? Because I'll do my bit. That means. <laughs> what would it take? What would it take for me to? Yeah, to 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 adopt that look again in that picture, if you can remember it. Um, probably a severe head injury. That's what it would take. <laughs> um, I just, yeah, I know, I know who Paprika Jones is, uh, and is is a very good looking and very well dressed man. Uh, he's got a band called Modern Guilt, who are really really good, and I urge people to go and listen to them. There you go. I've okay. done my bit. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, guy called Francis Bottomini but we've already covered what he's asking really about the second album stuff um, Daniel Ferguson says why were Black Wire never bigger despite being better than commercially commercially bigger peers in my, in his opinion it's because, a difficult one Francis for you but... well as I mentioned before because people are stupid you know? <laughs> <laughs> well I mean I don't know it's, I like to think, I mean, the music that I'm into is generally not very popular in terms of record sales or the amount of people that listen to it or anything. And I think that is, that music is fundamentally better than, you know, something like fucking Kings of Leon or whoever these huge bands are. Um, I think... Uh, I don't think, I don't know. I, I mean, that guy has obviously just got really good taste. Um, <laughs> and and a lot of people don't, you That's know. Them, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, why Why did, you know, nobody buy that first Velvet Underground record when it came out? Why did it take decades for it to be sort of reappraised? I don't know. Mm. Well, that's what'll happen to us. <laughs> <laughs> and then you'd be playing shows. Uh, well, yeah, maybe. <laughs> well, yeah, um, if somebody's going to offer us a million pounds, I mean, I could probably find a couple of weeks to do some rehearsals. <laughs> uh, yes. What do what do you make of of music now? Then do you think music uh, nowadays? It's a, I know it's a bad question, it, but like, is it just different? Is it as healthy as it ever was? Do you think? Yeah, I mean. I, I don't, I don't really, I mean, I don't really know anything about the mainstream, if there is mainstream, I'd like sort of what's on Radio 1 or anything like that. Um, I don't really know what is mega popular. I mean, I'm aware that K-pop is like a huge thing. Um, it's, it, it's not really my cup of tea, uh, just because, uh, you know, I mean, it's not the kind of music I listen to. I think there's a, there's a huge amount of bands and artists that are getting a lot of coverage in things like you look at something like you know DIY magazine. Mm. Do you, uh, I don't know if you know that they, they, they've got it on the internet and everything now. <laughs> um, but every issue they they've got they've got tons and tons of new bands and artists in there that. Not only have I never heard of, but I've never seen the name crop up anywhere. And I think that's brilliant, you know. Um, like we were talking about these, all these difficulties that young people must face starting bands and things like that. It's good that it's not stopping them, you know. There's, 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 um, it was I listened to the other day. Uh, yeah, I, I read, so again, in DIY magazine, I saw a little feature on a band called Lambrini Girls. I'm like, right. hockey and hell. After after life, that is the best name you can call it. Band, a good name, yeah. And so yeah, I was listening to them and they're great. And and Spotify is an evil of evils in terms of uh, you know, paying artists. 
and it's a fucking joke and it's disgusting and someone should do something about it. I don't know what, <laughs> right? But a good thing about it is, and a lot of people slag off the algorithm, but I think a good thing about it is the algorithm because if I'm listening to a new band, let's say Lambrini Girls, and then I scroll to the bottom, I can have a look and see, you know, what all the bands either sound like them or, uh, or are in some way connected. And that, you know, that spreads the reach of those bands. Not that they get any money for it, but, you know, makes me aware of it. They should just be happy about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but, um, like, uh, oh, sorry. sorry. No, it, it just got me thinking because I saw, I saw a study um, about, like, kids or young people. That, they're one of the first generations to consume or spend less money on alcohol and consume less drugs mm. than than any previous sort of like young generation. I find that fascinating as well. You know, not that that's got anything to do with it. I do, it just popped into my mind. No, it is really interesting. Um, yeah. I think what, Dan, um, what... Dan mentioned that actually. I think it was Dan yeah. the teacher at some point. Or is, yeah, uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. He said, oh, um, yeah, yeah they're not as interested in getting hammered. Do you think that's because of like, do you think there's more self awareness for social media and stuff like that? Yeah, I, I, I think it's a myriad of things. I, I think that's a really good point though. I think that's definitely something, you know, you don't want to be getting, you don't want to be hammered and your mates mugging you off on Snapchat yeah. or something like that. I think that's something to do with it. I think the the, the the cost of, you know, a pint in, I mean, I don't know how much it is where you are, but a pint around here, like it, it's pushing like £6.50. Yeah, yeah. Right? The minute it gets to £7 being the average price for a pint, I'm not drinking ever again <laughs> that's ridiculous um so i think yeah i think it's a social media thing i think the cost i think maybe there's also a kind of like thing of like and and i hope this is part of it maybe kids are thinking that's what older people do that's what my mum and dad does yeah, you know, yeah. I'm, I'm rejecting that i hope that's something to do with it but they're all into like i can drink they're into like probiotics and yakult and stuff right on the way to work on the bus the past few weeks there's school kids getting on and stuff and they're all drinking like actimel and yakult like, what's all that about <laughs> like, they spend they're spending all the money on like vitamins all right Is that the new prime or whatever <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the shop across from me sells that 11 pound a bottle okay now i wouldn't spend that on wine no, that is insane. Yeah, I literally bought a bottle of wine for half the price for that last night. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and oh, I was going to mention something, then, that's annoying. Uh, but in terms of music, have you when do you like do you do anything with it now, or just completely sucked it off? No, um, <clears throat> I don't. I don't do music uh, at all anymore, and there's there's a couple of reasons for that. One is that music making music for me is something that if i'm going to do it i have to do that as my primary thing it has to be that all the time if i can't put everything into it then i can't see any point doing it um you know, i i couldn't be one of those people that you know like a sort of like a weekend composer or i mean i couldn't be a fucking composer or anything but you see my point mm. um, I'd, I'd i'd have to do it full time if I was going to do it you know um, and that's just not possible and also because I'm I'm getting older um, like I, I go to the gym now you know, you've got to look after yourself in it right um, and I go to the gym now and I don't think that you know, I think you can either be in a punk band or you can go to the gym you can't do two <laughs> you can't you can't but you can't be in a credible band and go to the gym. It's a joke. <laughs> That's a great soundbite. I love it. Um. Okay, mate. Yeah, and thank cheers for your time. It's been a. You're been welcome. A good it's been uh, it's been wonderful. Yeah. Um. So yeah, finish on that one. I sent you favorite album of the the two thousands. Right. Okay. So initially, um, I was going to say uh, original pirate material by the Streets. Um. It, it's. it's one of the albums that's really stuck with me all the way through. I can listen to start to finish. 
Um, but it was a toss up between that and 80s Matchbox, Beeline Disaster, um, Horse of the Dog. Um, and I, I kind of want it to be Horse of the Dog because I think everybody uh, who listens to this will have listened to that Streets record loads and know loads about it. There might be some people who listen to this that have never heard Horse of the Dog by 80s Matchbox, Beeline Disaster. And, and they should. You know, they, they should. I think it's it's an incredible record. Uh, it's I think it's quite timely having that as my favourite record because the band have just re-released it mm. um, with loads of B-sides and things. And it sounded like nothing else at the time. It, the, the production on it is amazing. Like, I don't know a great deal about production, but I know what I like. And I like the production on that. And it was produced by Paul Tipler. Um, who produced the first Idlewild record. And you can kind of hear some of that sonic dynamics between the two. Um, uh, sort of within that, I think the lyrics are uh, incredible. For a band that, that sound very angry, very intense, um, and, and very forceful, um, the lyrics, and I could be wrong about the lyrics, but the lyrics to me seem to be about, a lot of it seems to be about the um, like struggles with uh, the idea of masculinity, about the fragility of the male ego um, and things like that. And, yeah, I, and I think, yeah, that just makes it even more credible and worthwhile. You know? um, the guitar sounds on it, uh, incredible. And it it's, it's, I think it's less than 25 minutes long. It's a fucking urgent record. You know, it's got like, it gets in there. It's got somewhere to be, you know, it's like, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's really forceful. Um, it's great. And I, I urge anyone who hasn't heard it to go and listen to it. And if you have heard it, just listen to it again. Yes. Did you ever get the chance to play with them? Yeah, we played with them a few times. We played with them quite a lot of times, actually. And, they, you know, when you see bands on stage and they're trying to be really intense and they, they you know, they're giving it all the, all the moodiness, and it comes across as really contrived. Uh, I think they're probably one of the only bands I've seen where it's it was just genuine. It was like if they weren't on stage doing that band, I dread to think what they would be doing. Um, because it just seemed like the perfect outlet for them. They looked amazing. They sounded amazing. And they're a really nice bunch of dudes as well. You know, just really kind, really sweet. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping that because they're re-releasing that first album, that they might do some gigs. I don't know. We'll see. You know? oh, that would be cool, yeah. But don't... don't but, it, but if they do, don't come asking Black White to support you because we're not getting back together, lads. <laughs> All right. Oh, that's excellent, mate. Nice one. Thank well, you very um, much. Yeah, that'll oh, be on. Before, on sorry. before we go, what's your favourite record? Because you're always asking yeah. other people what theirs are, and I, I was interested in what yours was. <clears throat> the answer I've been giving people is um, it's Room on Fire, but I, I, think right. I, need to come, I need to come up with a cooler one on that, I think. <laughs> nobody's nobody's had nobody's had the guts to do is this it have they I think Lloyd, I, Lloyd did did he right yeah because yeah. so, yeah, I keep hearing people go well you know is this it is like you know it's a bit of a given it's like yeah but if that's your favourite one then just fucking be honest say it yeah, yeah. But Room, yeah. On, Room on Fire is great yeah really good yeah I think I think the fact that it just didn't get hammered like is this it did in terms of getting overplayed Obviously, yeah, obviously think, the singles have done, but yeah, they were they were they were in a really bad position, though, weren't they? In terms of everyone wanted the second album to sound like the first one. Mm. Everyone wanted that, but people were expecting them to go and do something different. So whatever they did, people had gone, "You haven't done what I want you to do." Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah. And there's a lot of lazy yeah. opinions flying about at that point. I think. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Like yeah. a lot of bandwagon, like. Yeah, people like Noah Gallagher like writing off, writing it off and stuff, and like you just you just saying that because other people have. Well, exactly. Uh, that guy has got 
n- whatever opinion he's got on music has got zero weight to it whatsoever. <laughs> I, I, I genuinely think there is a man who doesn't actively like music. Did you ever listen to his Desert Island disc? Ah, uh, well, I don't. I think Can't it was just that. fucking. It was. It was exactly what you'd expect it to be. It was fucking Beatles. It was Led Zeppelin. It was fucking Slade. Like I love Slade, but I mean, come on, you know, it's like it's just, mate. Do you enjoy music? It's like the whole <laughs> thing about. It's like when he was going. When he was going. Oh, hip hop, hip hop, rap, or rap music doesn't belong at Glastonbury. Do you remember uh, that? Yeah, I remember the Jay Z stuff. Yeah. Fucking arsehole. Because that's not what he meant, is it? I mean, we all know what he meant by saying that. But, yeah, fuck him. <laughs> um, yeah, have you, have you watched Meet Me in the Bathroom? I have, yes. What do you yeah. make of it? Um, I was slightly underwhelmed, but I think that was probably to be expected because the book is, is such a weighty tome hmm. and it goes into such detail. Um, that the documentary was always going to be a bit of a letdown. There's, there was one bit in it that I, I, I found genuinely emotionally moving, um, and it was um, what's this? What's the singer from Interpol called? Is it Paul Banks? Yeah, Paul Banks walking down the street in New York on the afternoon that nine eleven had taken place and he's one of his friends is filming him with the video recorder and they're just sort of wandering around like what the fuck's happened and he's just walking through all this debris and and it's the street's completely silent and it was funny because i mean i was there that night i wasn't there for 9 11 you know (laughs) it's not what i'm saying i remember it's happening i remember watching it on the tv as it was being reported and stuff. And then the deluge of footage and news reports and everything afterwards. And it was sad, but I think it's taken this amount of time and seeing someone who lived in New York at the time walking through those streets when it's completely silent with those debris on the floor. I, I just found it really, really moving. I mean, I don't yeah. know, maybe it's hung over or something. I don't know. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, no, I mean, it it's, was, yeah. it's nice seeing uh, footage of the more features and stuff. Um, mm. But yeah, I think yeah, it's a bit of a letdown. Yeah, I, I know what you mean. Do, yeah, I hope they don't do a British version of it. Well, it's definitely going to happen, isn't it? Oh, fuck you know. I keep hearing like different things like us. Oh, one's writing a book, or someone's making a film. So yeah, the the book I could handle. You don't, <laughs> want, you don't want the film. Do you know what I mean? You don't want to be looking at all them fucking. <laughs> 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 I, I, sorry, I, I, I know you probably want to get away, and I, no, I sorry. Just fucking love the sound with my own voice. No, I go for it, um, man, but I, I, there's something I wanted to ask you. Um, what do you make of the whole indie sleaze uh, phenomenon or movement or whatever it is? Because I can't get my head around it. Because to me, it doesn't seem to be about music. It just seems to be about the way people dress. Is that what it is? Yeah, I don't know that. Initially, I, th- I thought it was about like, like it's like the late two thousands, is it? It feels yeah. Like. I think it, it 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 looks like a more like a new rave yeah. kind of thing. But then it like latches just... on to like yeah, 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 and stuff like that. I don't yeah, know. right. Yeah. See, because I, I I couldn't <laughs> get my head around it because no, I don't really understand. I, I kept seeing it come up, but. It, and it had mentioned a few bands, but it didn't have a massive, didn't seem to have a massive connection. And mm. it was just about the clothes. And then it, I was kind of like, well, why the fuck would anybody want to be dressing like that? Surely kids don't want to be aspiring to dress like that now. You know, it was exciting at the time, but we all look stupid. <laughs> yeah, I feel it's like more like the in between stage, like late two thousands when it's like stuff like dubstep creep around the corner stuff like that and people didn't really know right. what they were doing i associate it with that but i don't know if it's right okay right yeah uh, yeah i thought maybe like... I somebody younger than me it was, <laughs> uh, i'd get a, i'd get a clear answer well, obviously nah, <laughs> nah. just immediately makes you think of like mcat and stuff like that <laughs> right yeah yeah it do, yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah um but yeah 
Yeah, but I mean, that their their accounts doing ridiculously well. It's like I know it's a mental amount of followers. Yeah, yeah. but I mean, I'll 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 eat my own words when I see kids starting to dress like that again, right? But it it's not going to happen. You know, I'm sure they just look at it to laugh. <laughs> Yeah, I love all the uh, the piss taking about the emo haircuts. It's hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, all right, mate. Nice one. I'll, uh... Thank you so much. It's been lovely. No worries, mate. This will, I'll put this will be on Patreon tomorrow, but um, it'll be on other stuff at some point. Yeah. Fantastic. But, yeah. Thank you very much. Cheers, okay. Tom. Yeah. Be safe. Yeah. And you. Yeah. Okay. Bye. Take care.